House Bill 1341 deals with the Law Enforcement Procedural Guarantee Act, which a lot of people haven't heard of, and the reason we haven't heard of it is it's almost never used. And the reason it's almost never used is because it's broken. So what this would do is bring the Law Enforcement Procedural Guarantee Act into the 21st century. How is it broken? Right now, if an officer or trooper has a grievance against the agency for which they work, the Virginia State Police or the Police Department, um, they'll bring that grievance and there'll be a three-member panel that hears that grievance. One member will be selected by the grievant, one member will be selected by the agency, and one member will be selected by the members selected by the grievant and the agency, but will be from the agency. Imagine then if Delegate Thomas had a complaint against uh, the agency which was headed by Delegate Wilt, and Delegate Wilt got to pick two of the three members of the panel that would hear the complaint. Delegate Thomas would probably feel, and I think rightfully, that he might not be getting a fair shake. What we feel is that this creates at the least a perception of bias on behalf of the agency that is of management over labor. So what this bill would do is allow one member of the three-person panel to be picked by Delegate Thomas or the grievant, one member to be picked by the agency, Delegate Wilt, and then a third member to be picked by those two members but not be from management, from the agency. So that would be, if as it stands, if the, agents, if the person had to be picked from the agency, Delegate Wilt would pick Delegate Batten, right? Now you've got two people on this side of the dais versus one on that, the other. The effect of the change would be to have the grievant, the agency, and a third party agreed upon by those two parties. So essentially it is removing the, the perception of bias. I would argue the reality of bias because I want to please my boss usually. Um, it, it, it gives transparency to the public. It ensures confidence in the procedure, right, that the, that the agency isn't able to cover up malfeasance on its part by stacking the deck of the people who are the arbiters of what's right and wrong. Uh, the other things that it would do is provide a right to appeal to the grievance that doesn't exist now, at, at least now without their own expense that is going to circuit court and hiring an attorney. And as we know, and Delegate Mundin King certainly knows, law enforcement professionals are probably underpaid and underappreciated. Um, so so it, it provides them that route to an appeal. It also makes uh, the ruling binding less uh, with the exception of the appeal. And the fourth thing it does, which I think is incredibly important, um, is provides uh, essentially discovery. Right now, the grievant can have a complaint against the agency, and the agency has no duty to reveal the information they have that they intend to use against the grievant. What I see good judges do often is say, we don't want trial by ambush in my courtroom. And right now, trial by ambush is a very real thing as it relates to how we administer this 1978 act that's never used because it doesn't work and because the public and troopers and police officers don't have any confidence in it. So with that said, Mr. Chair, I have David Ostwinkel from the Virginia State Police Association and uh, my friend, former delegate and Senator Bill Carrico here. They can probably shed more light on specifics, but that is this in a nutshell. We have a process for grievances. The process isn't used because the process doesn't work. The process doesn't work because the public rightly perceives bias. Thank you, Delegate Gary. Questions from the committee? Before we turn to public testimony, uh, Chair Simon. Uh, Mr. Chair, a question for the patient. He described this as a grievance process, but if I'm looking at the, and this isn't part of the new language, I'm just trying to understand the context of the bill. These are grievances that come up whenever a law enforcement officer is dismissed, demoted, suspended, or transferred for punitive reasons. So these aren't necessarily grievances where they're unhappy with uh, of, you know, workplace conditions or things like that. It's, it's specific to when they're dismissed, demoted, suspended, or transferred. Is that right? Right. But the point that I would make to sort of flesh out my argument is, let's say you have a, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, is, let's say you have a whistleblower. Let's say you have somebody who's a lower ranking person who sees something wrong in the agency, and then they're punitively attacked, or that would be their assertion. They're not going to get due process. They're not going to get a fair hearing. They're not going to get discovery of the information to be used against them. And the panel will be stacked because essentially two out of three members will be coming from the management side of the, of the spectrum. Mr. Chair, another question? Uh, Delegate Simon. So the other question I have is we passed some legislation here. I, I actually carried a bill in the 2020 special session, I'm trying to remember all those sessions that we had, on uh, decertification of, of police officers. And it was an effort, essentially, um, what we called the bad apple legislation, right? And, and you know, I believe that in most cases, 99% or more of, of police officers are, are good police officers and care about wanting to do the right thing. But one sort of bad apple can really ruin the culture yep. of, of a department. And so we tried to make it easier 
uh, in that instance to deal with bad apples. Um, this doesn't seem to touch the decertification process, which is sort of different, but I think, I, think, I guess, a re, a re, so if I were to send a request for decertification to DCJS under the bad apple legislation, would that be something that this makes more difficult to do? In other words, we make it harder to, to remove bad apples. So the most important thing to know is what you don't know, and I don't know, but I'll bet you David Oswinkel, the attorney for the State Police Association, can address that. But I, I agree. I've worked with a lot of law enforcement professionals. Most of them are good. Some of them should be decertified. Thank you. Maybe we'll turn to public testimony, and, and those can also um, answer uh, Chair Simon's questions. Please identify yourself. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Members of the subcommittee, I'm David Oswinkle on behalf of the Virginia State Police Association. Um, and uh, Delegate Simon, with respect to uh, the decertification process, those are two independent processes. Um, if there was a, a grievance with respect to a disciplinary action, um, that was uh, <clears throat> addressed under the Procedural Guarantee Act. Um, the, uh, any finding of fact um, under that process would be separate and distinct from the decertification process. They have their uh, uh, codified process, uh, which is already established in law with standards uh, related to decertification. Um, and, and while a finding may be uh, <clears throat> something that would be addressed on behalf of the person that, um, in, a, in a defense for decertification, um, of course, those standards could be applied uh, contrary to any finding under uh, the disciplinary grievance. Thank you. Uh, anyone further wish to be heard in favor? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Bill Carrico with the State, Virginia State Police Association. I, I'm the executive director, and, and as you've heard from our general counsel, we have kind of looked at this uh, section of the code. Um, we've been in existence, our association's been ex in existence for 50 years this year, fighting for our guys for fair processes and pay and so forth. And 46 years ago, we were a big part of the guarantee, Procedural Guarantee Act. In the beginning, it was used more often, but then our members started seeing how unfair the, the panel makeup is. And very sel I don't even know if it's ever used now because of the, the fact that it's there. So fast forward 46 years, we, we're now at a point where we're just trying to modernize how this panel is set up make this uh, decision binding and give due process to what is in place. Um, I know uh, from the testimony uh, earlier that, that there was a mention of cost. I would have to really understand how a cost is, is associated with this. This is current law. Every department, including the state police, supposed to have this process in place today because they're required by law to do it. The only thing that changes is how we go outside of those, uh, those members selected to pick someone outside of the agency to make, the, make this a level playing field. And I would further say that it could be a cost savings by making it binding because then you don't have a second process that the agency uh, goes through if they're not happy with the recommendation. So um, I hope that you'll really consider this. Our guys really feel like the deck stacked against them. This just makes it fair for them. This is something that we looked at as an association and felt like it's important that our uh, members have this opportunity to use this um, law that's currently in place. Thank you. Those wishing uh, to speak in opposition to the bill. Good morning, Chairman. Um, I am Chief Maggie DeBoard. I'm with the Virginia Association of Chiefs of Police, and we strongly oppose this bill. And in the area that we do oppose the bill is the binding nature of the bill. Um, the suggestion about changing the composition of the bill um, does not concern us at all. We feel that may be a, a good change, but the binding nature um, clearly interferes with the authority and the responsibility of police chiefs to discipline, transfer, demote um, our officers uh, when they engage in misconduct or, or other disciplinary actions. 
And, you know, to speak to your de delegate Simon, to speak to your issue about decertification, um, this does have an impact on that. Um, I sit on the DCGS executive board. I, I hear decertification appeals. And one of the things that is in process right now is there is, um, uh, and it has been a practice, but it is uh, in a decertification bill this year, is to fix the process piece so that we do not hear um, disciplinary matters before uh, regarding decertification until all grievances appeals have been exhausted. So we want to make sure that that due process is in place, that, they, that the officer or the deputy has you know, access to um, exhaust those pieces before they come before a decertification and heal, uh, appeal hearing. Um, if we want to make certain that decertification for officers uh, for misconduct, th this bill truly creates roadblocks for us. Um, it ties the hands of a police chief who wants to do those things, and it, and it can create liabilities uh, for a locality to have to put an officer back to work that maybe may have engaged in misconduct, but a hearing panel decided that they should not lose their job. And and I know um, to speak to the the comment about um, it's never used. I've seen it used numerous times in my career, um, where officers uh, were put back to work, um, and two of those were termination cases. Would have been termination cases. Um, the current law also, the way it is right now, um, does not interfere with an, a locality who is engaging uh, in a um, uh, uh, union contract and could negotiate a binding piece for their agency if they chose to go that route. So that still is an option now um, for localities who want to negotiate that. Um, and lastly, I'd say this bill also would create um, an even greater disparity between the authority of police chiefs and sheriffs um, because this law does not apply to sheriff's departments in their ability and their responsibility to hold officers accountable for misconduct. So for, for those reasons, we, we especially oppose the binding nature of this bill. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, those uh, further wishing to be heard on the matter, the bill is back before uh, the committee. Questions from the committee? Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, Chairman Simon. I just, I can't vote because you're all here, which is great, but um, I appreciate uh, the delegate bringing this forward. Um, in addition to the concerns raised by the chief, I also have a concern. These are generally considered personnel matters, and with this appeal piece that goes to the circuit court, you know, how do we protect that? And I get that if they decide to appeal, they're kind of waiving their, their, their personnel, you know, privacy pieces of it. But more important for me is we just did, implemented this new and improved decertification process a couple of years ago. Um, I would hate to do something now that starts to throw up a roadblock to that. And so I uh, appreciate the, delegate, the delegate's efforts here, but my hope will be that the committee will not move forward with this bill. Delegate, thank you, Delegate Simon. Delegate Batten. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I understand the concerns about the binding nature of it, and I'm curious if the patron would consider it a friendly amendment if that language was removed about it being a binding decision. I, I would absolutely think that that was a step in the right direction, and I would accept that as a friendly amendment, and I'm grateful for the input from the from the police chief. Um, so uh, there's a proposal, however, we're, we're going to get some clarification as to actually what that would look like. So there's a proposal from Delegate Batten to amend House Bill 1341 and would ask counsel to um, let us know what that would be look like line 39 yeah mr. chair I think the amendment would be on subsection D to restore that last sentence to the original language essentially saying such recommendations shall be advisory only but shall be accorded significant weight uh, I think with that amendment though you also need to strike subsection e regarding the appeal since these are not binding decisions anymore okay so the amendment uh, as reported by counsel and as requested by delegate Batten is before us Second. The amendment's been seconded. All those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Okay, the amendment carries. So House Bill 1341 is before us as amended. Um, further questions or comments from the committee? Um, motions from the committee. Mr. Chairman, I have a motion. Delegate Wiltz. I move that report is amended. Second. The motion has been made and properly seconded to report um, House Bill 1341 as amended. Um, the clerk shall open the roll. That motion fails.
Thank you, Delegate Garrett. Thank you, Chairman and members of the committee.